Welcome to segment six of our course on Catholic doctrine. Again, I would encourage you to go to the handbook, the independent study handbook that you've received, to um, check out the handouts that are in there for you to read and the assignments that are there for you to uh, take a look at and f complete for the certification. Um, what I want to talk about during this segment is Jesus. Um, of course, the center point uh, of our Christian faith and our Catholic faith is Jesus. Um, the interesting thing about Jesus is he um, challenges people uh, and he focuses on not so much his teachings, although he does teach, but his real interest, particularly when he's working with his disciples and who the people who he's relating to is who he is as a person. And that has lots of implications of his what he's here for and what he will accomplish. In Mark chapter 8, verse 29, he asked the apostles, Who do you say that I am? And everything that um, really embodies their discipleship kind of depends on the answer to that question. And I think that that's a good question for us to ask ourselves, too. Who do you say that Jesus is? Who is he for you? Not so much from a standpoint of, well, whoever you want him to be, that's who he'll be, but from a standpoint of, have you discovered who Jesus is in your life, and what does it mean for you? Uh, because who Jesus is is not just sort of an optional Thing for us. It's something that uh, there's a reality there that as Christians we have to get in touch with. Hopefully in this segment we'll open that up a little bit for you and maybe uh, offer you some implications for your life. Some of which you're probably familiar with already, but some of which we may take a step a little further than what you've thought about. Um, one of the things that I think we have to make sure that we uh, realize that Jesus of Nazareth is the Son of God, the second person of the Blessed Trinity. Um, he's the Word of God in human form. Um, so God, the Son, existed before Jesus of Nazareth was born. That's confusing for some people sometimes who think, well, when Jesus of Nazareth came to be, God the Son came to be. Well, no, God the Son, the Word of God, as uh, the first chapter of John's Gospel says, existed from the beginning with the Father, and all things were created through him. Um, that's kind of heavy, but it is important as kind of a starting point. Um, Jesus Christ, the Son of God become human, is the ultimate revelation of who, of who God is. We've mentioned that before, and I think it's important for us to, to realize that if, we, if and when we do answer this question, who do you say I am, we get in touch with who God is, and it helps us Christians maybe get past some of these false images of God that we've been talking about in the past. I like the way the general directory for catechesis talks about Jesus Christ as God's pedagogy. In other words, God's trying to teach us like we would teach a child. And what do we do when we try to teach a child? We try to express things in language and symbols and realities that they can kind of 
understand and, and get their hands uh, on and, and wrap their minds around a little bit. And for us, it took um, Jesus to come in the form of a human being. And that's our first, I think, really important point about who Jesus is. Uh, it's a word that we may not use that much, although I think um, it's important for us to see and understand this word of what it is. Um, Jesus is the incarnation. As St. John's Gospel, uh, the first chapter says, um, Jesus Christ is the Word made flesh. Um, it's it's a little hard to get in touch with that sometimes. You know, I, I think that we end up with uh, uh, that kind of both and situation again. God in human form, you know, the Word made flesh, uh, says a lot to us about who God is. First of all, um, God was willing to do or really, in a sense, to undo Adam and Eve's sin. If you think about what Adam and Eve's sin was, they were tempted by the serpent to be like God. If you eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you will be like God. And so they thought, wow, great, yeah, we want to be like God. And in a way, isn't that all of our temptation in terms of sin? We want things our way. We want to be the center of the universe. We want to be... Um, on a throne in a sense. We want to be God. And God in Jesus Christ really kind of undoes that. We want to go up and be like God. God comes into our reality and is like us. Affirming who we are really and helping us to see that who we are is our project and not trying to become what we are not uh, so in Jesus Christ in the incarnation in carne is, is really the Latin word for flesh so the enfleshment of God in Jesus Christ we know some some things about God that are very important God is near God is with us God is compassion. God walked with us. Walk a mile in my shoes. God did that. God is vulnerable, willing to risk all, willing to be a little baby. You know, it would have been so easy for Jesus just to appear when he's 30 and start his ministry and not worry about the whole experience of human life that Jesus went through being born and experiencing all of life until his death on the cross. God is self-giving. Uh, God is challenge, showing us how to live, kind of overcoming a lot of the things that we have to overcome. God knows our walk. Another really important thing to realize in terms of the Incarnation is God, a Jesus is in God, God in Jesus Christ, walked a downward path. Um, it's kind of like coming off the pedestal and walking the opposite road that so many, uh, so much of our human strivings uh, flow out of a kind of a need for success, in the Incarnation, God shows a different path. And the ministry of Jesus really shows this different path, too, as he reaches out to the vulnerable, the marginalized, lifting up the sinners. And all, over and over and over again, Jesus shows us a spirituality that's a kind of a downward spirituality. Um, and helping us as Christians see that our walk needs to be, in some way, also a downward walk. A uh, um, kind of a continuation of this discussion, um, 
God uh, in Jesus Christ in the incarnation is truly God and truly human. This is really kind of hard to get our minds around. Um, but the dogma here is in Christ, there's one person, two natures. So in the Trinity, we had three persons, one God. Here we have one person, two natures. In one person, truly God, truly human. Really difficult, I think, uh, because it's a contradiction. It's a paradox. Um, but as St. Paul says in the second chapter of the Philippians, which we read before we were talking about the creeds, uh, God in Jesus Christ took off his godliness took the form of a slave, and walked among us. So God was able to surrender um, the kind of who he was as God. So it wasn't just, uh, he, there was a real taking on of a human form. Uh, Jesus Christ was really human in terms of feelings, um, fears, uh, all the things, the hopes and anxieties that we experience as humans, uh, except for sin. Jesus uh, always perfectly followed the will of the Father. And we see that over and over in the Scripture, too. Perfectly following the will of the Father. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he's struggling, facing the cross, he surrenders to the will of the Father. Um, despite the fact of being equal with the Father. So again, this, this gets difficult sometimes, but I think it's really important to remember. Uh, and when we come back to talk about uh, salvation and what it means for us, this aspect of Jesus being truly human and truly divine, we're going to come back to this and demonstrate how important that is to hold those two in tension and to maintain both sides of that paradox. Many of the heresies of the early church were about this. And we talked about Arius already in our discussion of the creeds, how he kind of went with, well, he's not really truly God, more than a human maybe. Not, you know, so he, he couldn't hold that paradox uh, it, together. You know, he couldn't hold the tension uh, very well there. So we, uh, uh, the early church in the first five or six centuries dealt with many heresies in that area and uh, came back to, in the Nicene Creed, as we mentioned, to true God, true human. So really important aspect of uh, who Jesus is. Um, Jesus died for us, of course, and we'll uh, come back to that when we talk about the issue or the theme of salvation, too. But Jesus really rose from the dead. Another, probably one of the most difficult pieces or dogmas that we have in our faith for, for people to accept that this person who died on the cross so terribly came back to life. Um, one of the uh, things about the New Testament, the accounts of the resurrection are all kind of mysterious and uh, they don't recognize him right away. They're not sure who this is. Is this a ghost? Is it not a ghost? He's here and not here. And so this resurrection, important for us to see that it was not a resuscitation. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. That was a resuscitation. Lazarus came back as Lazarus in human form and, um, for, uh, and to die again later. Jesus Christ returned still with his body but a glorified body so it wasn't just a uh, a kind of a vision um, one of the appearances really uh, has the apostles thinking Jesus was a ghost and Jesus says he's not a ghost and he shows them the wounds in his body and he also ate with them uh, on the seashore so he was still in bodily form but this was a glorified body. It was a transformed body. And um, says something to us 
about our destiny. So we also will rise just as Christ rose um, if we live with him and die with him we will rise with him this transformation is in the future for all of us and when he rose from the dead uh, he was the same person in one sense but past uh, that he was he became what we would say is the Lord of all um, kind of one with all of creation in his incarnation and resurrection, uh, he, um, in a sense, demonstrated God's oneness with all of creation and gave us a future, in a, in a sense, that would be for us a transformation just as his body was transformed into the glorified body, we will also be transformed, and all of creation will be transformed uh, at the end of time. Um, so there's this future. All of creation and all people will become one in Christ. Um, this is kind of hard to imagine, because we see ourselves as individuals, and uh, boy, if I die, I hope I go to heaven, and that's kind of it. I would sort of be in heaven as kind of in, I like I'm in a movie theater just looking at God and yet it's really going to be much more profound than that it will be uh, a kind of a total absorption into God and yet we will remain as individuals so we'll be kind of like we're assumed into the Trinity into the life of the Trinity um, This may be kind of over the top for you, but the, this is part of what the incarnation and Christ's resurrection um, unfolds for us. In Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 1, verse 10, it says, uh, The plan of God is to sum up all things in Christ in heaven and on earth which is kind of being uh, subsumed in Christ. So, um, I think one way to think about this is, this has a real connection to the Eucharist. In the Eucharist, ordinary bread and wine are transformed, changed, into the body and blood of Christ. We use the word transubstantiation. In other words, it still looks like bread and wine, but the reality, the substance, is the body and blood of Christ. Why bread and wine? Why leave this to uh, um, the church uh, at all? Um, wouldn't there be better ways of expressing uh, who Christ is and how Christ is with us? Actually, this is probably the best way of expressing. The ordinary... Um, I guess you could say commonplace drink and food that we would experience are transformed into who Christ is. If something that ordinary and that nourishing for us could be transformed into Christ, then why not everything? So theologians and the catechism kind of look upon the Eucharist as a foreshadowing of the future, that ultimate reality when not only the bread and wine are transformed into who Christ is, but the whole church, which is a reality every Sunday, the assembly is transformed into who Christ is. We become the body of Christ, and the entire world in the future will be transformed into who Christ is uh, in the Trinity. Um, I don't know about you, but that's something to hope for, to look forward to, that we will, uh, our destiny is to be one in Christ. So the Eucharist is uh, a sacrament that is bringing that about, making that happen. That's how Christ is present to us. 
and it's slow but sure transforming the world, slow but sure overcoming the powers of evil, slow but sure bringing all into unity with Christ. I remember uh, when I was a youth minister in a parish, um, this man and woman that were volunteers working with me there um, asked me a question that just stopped me short. They said, do you have a personal relationship with Christ? And I thought about that, and I thought, well, you know, I, I really have never taken that question very seriously. I've never really thought about it before. I saw myself as a good Catholic, saw myself as trying to do the best I could to stay away from sin, saw myself as a, a minister, but do I have a personal relationship with Christ? What does that mean? Um, and I thought about that for a long time afterwards, and I think part of what it means is Jesus invites Peter and Andrew to leave their fishing nets and come follow him and walk with the Lord into a whole new reality. And I think the invitation to have a personal relationship with Christ is that challenge for everybody. Walk with the Lord. Come follow me. Leave all the things that have been taking all your time up, all the cares of the world, the nets that maybe bind you, and follow the Lord. Living a life that He calls us to live, and really walking that downward path, being in some way an incarnation of his reality in the world and eventually dying and rising with him. Those are challenging thoughts. Um, I think all he asks of us is, is just to take the first few steps.